Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have an important subject today, a great report, and we have a pair of wonderful guests. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Last week, the EdTech consultant and, and beloved forum guest, uh, Phil Hill, published a report looking at recent stats from the National iPads database. And he found that currently in higher education, roughly one third of students are taking classes entirely online. And about an additional one third are taking a mix of online and in-person classes. Only about one third of students are taking classes entirely in person. That is to say that the long revolution of online learning just keeps growing and growing and seems to be succeeding, at least in numbers. That brings us to this week's topic and this week's report. The Chloe 8 report is a fantastic dive into how college and universities are actually implementing online learning. Uh, the authors, Bethany Simunich and Richard Garrett, have done a fantastic job of polling, surveying, and analyzing individual campuses and campus leaders to figure out just how we support, structure, maintain, and grow online learning. So if you haven't seen the report, look in the bottom left of your screen. You should see a kind of tan colored box that says Chloe 8. Click that and you'll find it. Now, if you'd like, also, uh, right below it, uh, or right next to it, should be another box that says sign up for the next Chloe. Click that so then they can contact you for the next report. I, I think this is absolutely brilliant and essential for anybody thinking about higher education right now. Uh, so without any further ado, let me start bringing folks up on stage. And I'll start off with Bethany Simunich. Hang on one second. And here we go. Greetings, Bethany. Hello. Thanks so much for having us, Brian. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, where have we found you today? I am in Ohio, and it's it's not snowing here yet. I usually make the joke of snow Ohio, but yeah. <laughs> it's cold, but it's a lovely day. Yeah. Uh, are, are you getting that that typical wind blasting down on you from the North Pole? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. I don't want to tempt the weather fates, but so far it's it's pretty nice today. So far, oh, good. Enjoy, enjoy. Ohio can be a lovely state. Um, listen, uh, Bethany, the way we introduce people on the forum is a little different. We ask people what they're working on for the next year. And so that's mm -hmm. just about all of 2024. I I'm curious, what projects are you looking forward to and what ideas are top of mind for you? Mm. Well, you know, for the past six or seven years, uh, my, my own research agenda has involved looking at how traditional uh, higher ed institutions implement online learning and looking at it specifically as a process of change management mm -hmm. and the unique supports that online learners and, and uh, online teaching faculty need. So from that has emerged uh, a framework or a landscape, if you will, about all the different ways that institutions really need to support online learning in ways that they may not be doing now. So mm. I hope to finish up um, some uh, advanced research on that this year. I'm interviewing some senior online leaders, speaking of Chloe, but doing some qualitative interviewing there and hope mm. to get a publication out on that. And uh, I also have a book coming out in February. Oh, wow. What's uh, it's it about? It's book, uh, High Impact Design for Online Courses, or High Doc for short. And it is a full instructional design model unique to online learning modalities. So it's it's coming out, I think, Valentine's Day. So I, I'm making the joke, makes a great gift. Oh, <laughs> great I'm Valentine's sure it will. For uh, all your faculty that love online teaching. So, well, And I think I'll love it already. Please, please send me a copy. I, I, would I love absolutely to use it. will, yeah. Um, well, that's fantastic. Good for you. Um, thank you, Bethany. Now, let me, let me pause for a second and bring to the stage your colleague and your co-author. Um, and I want to make sure that we can get everybody everybody together at once. Uh, and I think if I have it right, you two have completely opposite backgrounds. Uh, I think <laughs> yours is completely white or cream and Richard's is very, very dark. Yeah. Hello, Richard. Hi, Brian. How are you doing, sir? Doing very, very well. Nice to be here. Well, good. Well, speaking of here, where are you today? I am in my basement in Eatonton, Georgia. So I used to live in Boston, yeah. uh, UK originally, but uh, moved down here for the for the big houses and and uh, nice weather. Oh, I'm sure you're getting some of that. Um, well, uh, it's actually pretty cold, but but not by a north, not by our higher standards. No, not, not or not by a Boston standard where you have to uh, start worrying about uh, where to put all that snow now that it's stacked up. Um, 
Well, Richard, you, you heard the question that I put to uh, to dear Bethany. What are you going to be working on for the next year? Well, uh, all things online, but very much focused on non-degree uh, and, and even non-credit oh. programs. So as the the degree market in general, not least online, gets more and more crowded and various external factors, slow demand, slow enrollment, mm -hmm. more and more of our clients, colleges and universities around the country are interested in the non-degree space insofar as as I think about it, it pushes the logic of online convenience and career impact to the next stage and saying that arguably the degree is part of the problem. If you're trying to realize that, that knowledge, that career push a little bit faster. So we all know there's, there's some positive numbers around non-degree coming out of the clearinghouse and other sources, mm -hmm. but trying to understand those markets when the reporting is pretty weak, pretty fragmented uh, is a challenge. So, Hence, they turn to the likes of us to try and figure it out. Well, that's a lot of work. Um, do you do you include certificates in non-degree? Right, uh, anything and everything. I mean, there is there is not a great typology. It can be credit, it can be non-credit. The, the the nomenclature can be all over the place. So we we try and ha uh, be pretty uh, open-minded and broad about it, given the la the lack of uh, specificity. Understood. Understood. What a great project. Well, here let me rearrange the screen a little bit, uh, make things a little more congenial. Um, Richard, Bethany, thank you so much for coming. The, the way this works, friends, is I'm going to ask our, our guests a couple of questions, which hopefully will give them a chance to cut loose uh, and talk about the, uh, the report and their findings. Uh, but then it's going to be over to you. So as we start talking, please start thinking about what questions you would like to put to our guests. Um, take a look at the Clover report as, uh, as this goes on. And if you'd like to just start rambling and thinking out loud, hit the chat box. If you've got a question already in place, hit the uh, Q&A box. And of course, if you want to join us on stage, um, especially if you have a background that is neither blank white nor very dark, <laughs> make it more multichromatic, please, please hit the raised hand button. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, actually, and uh, some of the questions have come in from uh, other people who can't make it today. Um, but one of the things that really impressed me that I, I, I've, I've realized this, but I haven't really put it together, was you're finding that asynchronous is the dominant mode overwhelmingly. That what we're doing right now, a synchronous conversation, is actually pretty rare. Um, can, can you speak to that a bit? Why, why is that, and how is that playing out? Sure. Well, let me let me let me let me jump yeah. in. We'll volley, Richard. Richard. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> so this has been an interest of mine for for a long time, and I, I think it speaks to the how online has evolved so far and how people think about its value. So I think it's for many many years the dominant piece of the value proposition around line, online was convenience, and clearly asynchronous insofar as it frees up the individual to engage when it's convenient for them has some practical advantages, at least, over synchronous or hybrid mm -hmm. or whatever the alternatives might be. And I think even though asynchronous comes with some pedagogical limitations, mm -hmm. the power of that convenience, the kinds of people who tend to enroll in online, so far as they have very busy lives, other commitments, anything that compromises that convenience, I think, whether real or perceived, is seen as a potential red flag for a prospective student who is saying, well, I'm struggling enough to fit higher ed into my life. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to make me or, or even encourage me to show up at a particular time when my schedule is unpredictable or something happens, that's going to cause me some anxiety. So I think institutions feel that. And as the markets become more crowded and commoditized, they worry that They've been trading on convenience all this time. You know, you never have to come to campus. And insofar as they want to shift that, either for pedagogical reasons or student experience reasons or retention and completion reasons or just, just sheer learning reasons, they worry that the market isn't ready. They're running ahead of hmm. demand. and hmm. But they're caught, I think. I think everyone recognizes that online for it to evolve both in terms of appeal, enrollment, and in terms of perceived value and outcomes, we need to get beyond the 100% the asynchronous default. But I think it's in tension with how the market perceives the value of online, which is first and foremost convenience above anything else. And that that's a key tension that Chloe's tracked a little bit, and, and I think we'll continue to track as the market changes. 
fascinating. Yeah, oh, it's, it's that classic anytime, any place, anywhere flexibility afforded by asynchronous online. So traditionally, mm -hmm. graduate students, uh, even in some cases, adult undergraduate students had flocked to asynchronous because it fits in with their lifestyle. A lot of your graduate students are already working full time jobs. They want a way to extend or further their education. But what is surprising and what we have found during the pandemic is that there is a shift for campus-based students as well. And when you're thinking, well, campus-based students engaging in online learning, they want that same flexibility. So when they're juggling jobs, a busy schedule, campus-based courses as well, they want something that's going to fit into that schedule so they have a shorter time to graduation. Synchronous doesn't help in that regard. Right. So uh, one of the findings of, of Chloe Seven, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later, but a, a big finding of Chloe Seven was chief online officers predicting that you're going to have a see a more balanced experience for all different demographics of students. But traditionally, gender graduates, that's when that story started to emerge that they're taking more online classes, they're asking for more online classes. So in Chloe 8, when we sat down to, to look at that data, we were wondering, is this going to emerge as a hybrid being that balanced experience, or if balance meant on campus and fully online asynchronous? And how we're seeing it play out right now, at least, is that combination of on campus and asynchronous online learning. That seems to be that best match for busy student schedules and lifestyles right now. Oh wow! That, that, that's this is a huge takeaway. I think um, we have a we have a question from uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, our good friend John Hollenbeck um, queries the my question itself, and he says, "Isn't the online versus face to face a false dichotomy?" Well, yep, yeah, I, I think it is. Okay, moving on. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, please, please go ahead. No, I mean, I th I think it is in the sense that, as Bethany described. The typical so-called campus-based experience is in a sense hybrid uh, increasingly not for everybody but but whether in terms of what institutions offer what students sign up for it's more and more of a ad hoc random personalized uh, hybrid of the two but i do think for the adult undergraduate the the graduate student in fields where online makes any sense pedagogically have very much decided that the there's not a false dichotomy that there's a there's a choice there that uh, you can whether practically or in terms of uh, perception take a, a program and complete it fully online 100 percent asynchronous and notionally it's judged as the same experience the same credential it notionally has the same value and i've been looking for years to, to get a sense of whether at a certain point that version of online hits some upper limits uh, again experientially pedagogically perceived value or, or certain fields of study just can't accommodate it and that's when we start to mainstream these alternatives or just institutions saying well i'm the 600th online mba out there you know why am i just imitating the competition why don't i do something different that so perhaps is a little more consistent with who we are as an institution which typically is grounded in a face-to-face -face experience but i think we still don't quite see it. I, st I still don't see many institutions really standing up a very clear, compelling version of hybrid that seems to overcome the reticence around perceived loss of convenience and and talks up powerfully enough all the inconvenient things that you have to do if you're not 100 percent asynchronous. Yeah. And and the market, you know, in theory, people say, yes, you know, I could appreciate things that aren't 100 percent asynchronous. But when push comes to shove, there still seems to be this this rather instrumental approach to higher ed for these more these less traditional students. Where if you're if you're compromising that convenience, you're slowing my time to completion. You're not unless you give me such a compelling reason why that should be the case. Yeah. Then the market doesn't seem to be yet really raising its hand and saying, "Give me something other than 100 percent online, 100 percent asynchronous online." And, you know, I, I think that's a really compelling and good question about is this a false dichotomy? And that's something I think Chloe has been um, really looking at, especially since Chloe seven. And, you know, we even um, looked at it within the title itself is online becoming more mainstream. So I think that right now we are in or we are about to be even more in a situation where we are we need to stop othering online. 
and looking at it like in-person campus-based courses versus hybrid versus synchronous versus asynchronous versus high flex. It has become a universal uh, education experience. And what modality students choose to study in is starting to become less and less relevant. What is starting to become more re relevant is the quality and the type of education that they're getting regardless of the modality that they are studying. So when students are asking for flexibility, they're not just saying, give me more online classes. They're saying flexibility within you know, the institution that they're currently at or you know, about to enroll in, and they want flexibility within their own schedule. And also that assurance to know that no matter what modality I'm gonna take this course in, or, yeah. or if I transfer into a fully online degree program at my institution, I'm still going to get the same level of support. I'm still going to get the same quality of, of faculty, the same quality of teaching in my classes. And I think that's what institutions are struggling with right now, because supporting the online student in robust ways in the same way that we have traditionally supported on-campus students, not every institution is set up to do that. And not every institution is looking to do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's an example of the Q&A box question. And John, thank you, as usual, for a very good question. And, and thank you both, uh, Bethany and, and Richard, for fantastic, deep answers. Thank you. Um, we have uh, another question that actually popped up in the chat. Um, and this is from uh, uh, Karen. I always get her last name wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, Bellinier, or Bellinier, uh, who asks, what do, where does optional synchronous fit into this discussion? Well, you do see use of optional as an attempt by schools to find a happy medium. So rather than require synchronous, which then bumps into all these convenience concerns that we just talked about, optional allows those who desire it to engage or those who are available, allows the institution to get a sense of perhaps with some experience, students really gravitate towards this. So you do see it. I wouldn't say you see it a lot i wouldn't say it's becoming the norm but mm -hmm. for certain institutions certain fields of study certain preferences on the part of the faculty members you're starting to see it but i still think it as bethany was implying i think the real question is not so much is it synchronous or is it asynchronous the devil's in the detail what's actually being done with that synchronous time mm -hmm. if it's if it's used wisely and engagingly then it can add a lot of value if it's simply we need to show up and be in the same space virtually to feel like we're the faculty member feels satisfied or, or whatever that whatever the question is you know obviously it all it all comes down to pedagogy and instructional design yeah. whatever the modality is and i think so often as we know in higher ed these things are not surfaced they're not thought through uh, everything's devolved which certainly means some pockets of excellence but a lot of unthinking mediocrity if you like and right. lack of uh thought about it and i think on you know we, we just we want to avoid confusing modality with pedagogy the, the two interrelate but they're not the same thing and just because you're something synchronous and asynchronous doesn't really tell you very much whether it's fit for purpose or any good yeah and i, I mean i think we could spend a whole hour on on synchronous alone um i i think part of the conversation around synchronous is how online learning became unnecessarily and terribly conflated with remote learning during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So during the pandemic, you had remote courses, which were not online courses. They were courses that were designed to be taught in person that were then hastily migrated in an emergency to a, a virtual environment for the purpose of academic continuity. But what resulted from that were faculty and students, and I think the public is, is included in that, they had an online experience. And so many of them that didn't have a grounding in online and had not taken good online courses prior to that, they said, oh, well, this is online. And, and that became that, you know, the discussion of this is what I can expect online in a synchronous environment. So you have a lot of institutions and wonderful teaching faculty who have progressed from that point and really looked at synchronous pedagogy and how to really engage students in that virtual environment. But I think you still have a lot of institutions that have remote learning courses, you know, as a carryover and they relabeled them as synchronous. So it's, it's like, you know, almost every conversation 
conversation that we have about online learning or frankly, you know, on campus learning, not every course is the same. And I think students and faculty alike, um, you know, we're heading into an era where we are going to better discern what am I actually getting for my educational investment? Mm, mm, mm. Well, that's a very, very good point. A nice sting in the tail of that sentence to think about. <laughs> um, friends, uh, I've got I have one more question um, from my own, which actually comes from um, what you both just said. Um, and Karen, thank you for the really good question, um, which is, one of the other findings of the report, again, if you haven't read the report yet, please absolutely grab a copy and, and run with it, um, was that, I'm going to try and paraphrase this, and please, I might get this wrong. It, it, it seems that a lot of institutions underprepare faculty for teaching online. Um, you, you break this down into training, the role of teaching and learning centers, uh, but it seems that there's a, a good number that uh, might lead to some of the different pockets Richard spoke about um, because they're teaching online without ever really being trained to do so. Um, can, can you, am I, am I summarizing correctly? And, and can you speak to that point a little bit? Yeah, I, I think you are. Um, I'm going to start with my own little story about how I moved to online. So I, I was a former faculty member who was teaching face to face. And this was you know almost 20 years ago at this point. I was oh. asked to teach a course online. And I thought, well, how hard can that be? <laughs> I get to come to campus less. I need to upload some some materials, and you know, it's it's going to be fine. Um, I'm sure that the majority, if not all, of your audience is laughing right now because I I, I quickly found out how difficult it could be, and. The, even though that's my own story, that's a very common faculty story, and it's a common institutional story that we think if you can teach well in the in-person, face-to-face -face classroom, surely that's going to translate naturally into effective online teaching. Mm -hmm. And most often it doesn't because it's a different type of classroom. It's a different type of learning environment. Designing courses for online is strategically different than designing courses for in-person, right? So I say that to, to, to set up the reality for where institutions are now. And the past uh, couple Chloe reports since the pandemic, we're seeing institutions say that we're going to offer more faculty development for online teaching. We're going to offer more faculty support for online teaching. And that is great in theory. But what we're seeing in practice is that it's optional. So we are we are yet again, you know, should a, another uh, uh, instance pandemic, what have you happen where we have to revert to, you know, virtual learning um, as the predominant modality, you are yet again going to be caught in a situation where faculty and in some cases students as well are going to be unprepared or underprepared. So it, it's this tension that's coming from you know, being a traditional campus based institution and looking at online as that as that side hustle that we offer or that mm -hmm. I think it was uh, termed uh, maybe by Phil Hill as like a side show. It no longer mm -hmm. is. And so how are you supporting faculty in this unique way in effective online teaching? Are you having conversations about regular and substantive interaction and what that means to actually connect with students in an online learning environment? So those are, you know, just to preview Chloe Nine a little bit, we're going to talk about RSI this year. And what we're seeing with institutions is that the policies are not following what the institutions really want to prepare for. It is those campus tensions where we really need to have some complex and crucial conversations around how to best support faculty and students and the institution as well if we are going to mainstream online and promise our students that it's going to be just as good as if they're taking a, a course on campus. But, but I, I mean, I agree with all that, but obviously online, the situation around online that Bethany describes, it's a symptom of a bigger problem in higher ed, which is lack of systematic attention to teaching and learning good practice. And it's not as if, and I know you're not saying this, Bethany, but it's not as if for campus-based courses, there's somehow a different set of circumstances. There's the same you know, lack of development, optional arrangements, uh, uneven participation, uneven student experience, so online, insofar as it's a novel modality, it was more obvious that some sort of development was needed as it, as it came in for different schools at different points in time. But I feel like online as a disruptive force is always in tension with higher ed as a domesticating force, if you like. And mm. depending on mm. where you are, what metric you look at, you know, the disruptions winning or the domestication is winning. And 
but culturally, you know, everyone says, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch. Yeah. And I think the culture of higher ed, which is anti centralized, uh, anti top down, anti imposition is I think proving stronger than any benefits that might come from a more rationalized approach to, to faculty development. So, you know, there, there isn't going to be a sort of winner here. I just think we'll continue to, to sort of move along and, you know, you do, I mean, the, the counter narrative is from the hundred percent online schools, which tend mm -hmm. to be very different, you know, no mm -hmm. tenure, mm -hmm. typically adjunct faculty, they're hundred percent teaching institutions in the main, and mm -hmm. they tend to report on Chloe a much more, systematic approach top-down approach to things like faculty development and but i suppose the question is and i don't think we have an answer to this is whether that tends to translate into a superior online experience at scale because wow. there's lots of confounding variables insofar yeah. as what kind of students go to that school you know they tend to be less well prepared you know if you look at the, the typical completion rates for a fully online school at undergraduate level versus a more conventional school you know the online graduation rates tend to be much poorer yeah. But, yeah. And to what extent is is faculty development making that better than it otherwise would have been? Or is it too cookie cutter and one size fits all? You know, have they overdone it somehow? So I think it's it's an ongoing conversation, but it's it just gets at this this root challenge of the, the nature and culture of higher ed. Oh, that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very, very deep cut. Uh, uh, well, I have questions, but I want to get out of the way and make sure that that all the audience can ask their questions. Uh, thank you both for, for those great answers. This is one coming from Jeff Alderson uh, at MathWorks, and we put this up on. Are we seeing a lag in online learning for disciplines with a hard requirement for hands-on projects or labs, or with specialized hardware and equipment, such as electrical, mechanical engineering, nursing, medical, and so forth? I, I would say there's no shortage of, of online nursing degrees um, in, in, in terms of, you know, lab based hard science courses and whatnot. This has been a prevailing question, uh, I think, for for years. But the pandemic, um, I think, kind of showed everybody that there are ways to do, you know, virtually every every course online. So I'm hearing and seeing more and more um, online options for labs to the extent that I was uh, recently on a, on a really good panel. Uh, with a uh, a professor, I think he's in chemistry, and he was saying that you know he teaches his his chemistry courses online, uh -huh. and students um, by and large are flocking to his courses, even if they don't go to that institution because they don't have the same option to take lab based courses online at their home institutions. So I think that that shows you two things. You definitely can do a, a lot of those those courses online. There are some things that may be precluded that really do need that hands on environment. But for a lot of them, they need re envisioned for for the online environment. It takes a little bit of thinking. Sometimes it takes a pretty big investment in in resources um, might be a higher cost for the students when you're looking at lab kits, all of those things. Yeah. But they have traditionally been been done online very well. And when your students, again, are looking at ways to, you know, fit that in their schedule and complete their education, if your institution is not offering, you know, all these electives and your general education courses and courses within the major, they are going to look elsewhere. And they are going to, you know, try to get those transfer credits or in some cases potentially transfer to other institutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'd say at the program level, there is still a disconnect between those more hands-on fields and scaled online delivery. I think at course level, it's it's a little, little different. And I think the challenges there are the difficulty of, of creating really good fit technology that doesn't take so long to build that by the time it's it's marketable, uh, the technology's moved on. Mm -hmm. I think we've been we've been seeing for many years efforts to try and create more immersive, more hands-on experiential components to online. And I think it just hasn't been the business model there, perhaps because faculty members don't tend to adopt solutions at scale in the same way that you might have, say, in a game-based environment in, in an entertainment mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think that's held things back. And it connects back to our synchronous, asynchronous discussion, because I think if you, the, the default mode of asynchronous tends to be tech centric and 
rather than more hands-on. And oh. I think that that has limited the pedagogical possibilities and at least at program level, because there are course level exceptions, but at program level, I just don't think there's a sense. And again, it can be different at grad level. If someone's got the, the hands-on fundamentals, you know, a grad program can make more sense for the online. Yeah. But I'd say undergraduate level, you know, hard sciences, performing arts, certain healthcare fields, clinical mm -hmm. fields, mm -hmm. it, hybrid at best, if you can separate the didactics from the hands-on, you know, like the RN to BSN, that market's worked very, very well yeah. because in effect, it's a hybrid program, even though the didactics are fully online. But I think beyond that, there either isn't the underlying demand, unmet demand that online scale would, would meet, or you just still haven't quite found a, the right combination of technology, business model, mm -hmm. willingness to adopt, uh, to scale these sort of subjects up at, at program level. Mm, mm. These are great answers. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and uh, definitely, uh, uh, Jeff, thanks for the really, really good question. There's a comment in the, in the chat from our, our dear friend, Sarah San Gregorio, who says that she helped with a Zoom-based acting class during the pandemic, and it required a big shift in learning goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we now have uh, um, a, a video question coming in from Dayamudra. Uh, so let me just bring them up on stage. Hang on one second. All right. Hello, Diamudra. Hello. Very fascinating. I've been reading this report since August when it came out. Wow. And I just want to give a shout out to the California Community Colleges. I think we are overlooked a lot, but the online network of educators has been groundbreaking. I started my training with them in 2017, mm -hmm. and they have a focus on really advanced pedagogy when it comes to humanized, equity-minded, accessible um, online education. And I just don't hear them shouted out enough. And I think that when the pandemic hit at my community college, we were ready because we had already been trained and a lot of people had been really resistant to online, but we had all the best practices set up and we were able to train people and people really turned around. So I think our program really does focus pedagogy and in the synchronous environment or the asynchronous environment, um, it really doesn't matter. I think it's just a commitment to student-centered learning. And at the during the pandemic, I was finishing my doctorate at a CSU, mm -hmm. and I've got to say I was not impressed with the way they mm -hmm. pivoted to online. And mm -hmm. it was not a student-centered approach. The pedagogy was really horrible. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the community colleges really get overlooked in these conversations, and I would really love some attention focused on what we're doing well. Here, here. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you, you have a, a, an ally, Diamudra, in the chat. Uh, John Hollenbeck says he's a graduate of Long Beach Community College. They were great in 1969 as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, CCs do not get enough love, enough enough attention. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good comment. And, and as, as you know from uh, reading Chloe 8, community colleges really came out strong in, in terms of supporting their faculty and supporting their students. Um, that was, I think that was one of the top three talking points uh, that, that came from Chloe, especially when we started speaking with audiences about it. Um, I, I think traditionally community colleges are also known for equity and equitable learning and access. And all of that speaks to online learning. So, um, you know, last year when we we asked them in terms of faculty preparedness and student preparedness and what they were seeing also from, um, you know, their students in terms of demand, community colleges, uh, ninety percent of those said that demand was increasing and their students taking online courses much less comparison for public or private four years. So I, I now that those colleges really that value teaching that by supporting the student and supporting the whole student, they really made that the focus and and I think pay off from it. And all I'd add is that I think what I'm curious to see is whether you know those institutions, like you say, who really do feel they've invested above average in good online pedagogy, to what extent does it start to be visible to the market? To what extent do students can the institution start to articulate that to the market and say online is not online over here online means abc or or you know downplay modality play up pedagogy and do, do students start to vote with their feet and say you know, that's what i want you know and 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 can it start to 
shake up what to me is a very, as I used the term commoditized earlier, and I'm not saying there are no differences, but fr from the student's point of view, mo and I'm talking more program level than course level, that the programs all tend to sound the same. They're all just leading with convenience and flexibility and mm -hmm. career centeredness for busy adults. But nothing wrong with that as a baseline. But the what should be the center of attention, the, the student experience, the pedagogy, the, the support environment, you know, why are we using this tool? Why are we synchronous? Why are we asynchronous? That, that we don't even seem to entertain the idea of speaking to the prospective student about that. And that being why they should enroll in this particular program, that the thread between coming in as a as a as a as a new student and coming out transformed the other end. And I think that that's what I'm always looking for is how can these pockets of excellence transform into something that is scalable, mm. too idiosyncratic, and starts to change the game in terms of getting beyond these these base words of online campus uh, to, to something that's more meaningful. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, Diane Mudra, thank you so much for that question and comment. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, Bethany is refreshing her screen uh, to take care of that audio glitch that we just had. Um, so thank you to her uh, and Richard both for these uh, for these great answers. And that's an example of a video question too. So if, you, if you'd like, just press the raised hand uh, to join us on stage. We'd be delighted to, uh, to see and, and to hear from you. Uh, we've got more questions piling up and, uh, and Richard, you get to tackle them solo until we get Bethany back on stage. Uh, so let me just bring these up um, so we get a chance to uh, look at them. Um, this is uh, an interesting question. I, I think there's a deep probe here for Andrew Peterson. Should the faculty be responsible for designing the online learning environment? Well, I suppose from my point of view, it should be a team effort somehow. I think that there's clearly various skill sets that go into a high quality online learning experience or course or program. And it would be difficult for any individual faculty or otherwise to somehow embody that. But again, it comes back to this, this baseline of higher ed culture where there's suspicion in some cases justified against any idea that there's some sort of uniform approach to teaching and learning that would constrain a faculty member's uh, freedom of choice. So I think a smart institution, if, if there's some cultural room for maneuver, should very much encourage a, a team-based approach, different nodes of expertise, and then trying to separate out where individual faculty choice and autonomy is fundamental versus where it's probably just reinventing the wheel, duplicating effort, creating unnecessary work. And where that line is, isn't, isn't always obvious, but I think ultimately there's a win-win there's here, freeing up precious faculty time to not be doing pedagogic sort of block building that, that should be taken care of institutionally or, or across a program or across a, a faculty or even across a discipline and reserving the, the faculty members personality contribution choice for you know, either live interaction with students or mm -hmm. you know, it's, it just comes down to this question of how do we optimize teaching and learning what what can be optimized in advance and almost self self service to the student emphasizing the convenience of asynchronous and what really needs to be social live almost unplanned and, and human-centered, and I think those two are both, uh, not, neither neither one can substitute for the other, but I think as a system, we're, we're very mixed up about which is which and and what approach to therefore apply and, and who should do what. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a really, really deep answer. Thank you, Richard. Bethany, welcome back. Hello, I, I didn't even know I had a glitch until you said refresh. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and, and now you sound perfect. Um, okay, thanks for that. Uh, oh, yeah. And was the question, should faculty design the, the online learning environment? Was that it, Brian? Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll put it on the screen here again. So, Thank uh, you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no problem. No problem. Should faculty be responsible for designing the online learning environment? Okay. I, you know, I would say it, it's, it depends on what you mean by that, Andrew. Um, it, you know, if, if I would parse that out a little bit, 
there is that <clears throat> there is the web based environment that's part of designing an online course. Um, and, and this is in the forefront of my mind. QM recently uh, designed with D2L Masterclass and designing LMS templates. It's actually going to be released tomorrow. So I've been really deep oh, wow. in, in this thinking about how you can support faculty with good web-based navigation, good organizational structures, so that they could really spend their time on the pedagogical elements of the course and designing that within. So in that case, I have to say yes and no. You know, as a faculty member, I don't, I didn't always want to make that decision for what should go in the navigation and how should this be structured. And, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't have the grounding in, in the research literature that really helped to guide me in that as well. But I did know how to teach my classes. You know, you know your discipline, you know how to effectively reach your students, you know how to effectively, you know, convey the knowledge and skills for that. So it's a combination. And I think also here's where um, enter into the conversation instructional designers. IDs are such a valuable member of a good online learning team at an institution so that they can really help with that learning design of the course in a virtual environment, in a digital environment. So I, I don't know that faculty, that we're ever going to be able to, to train faculty robustly in all the things that it means to design a high quality online course, right? I would rather reserve faculty's precious time to the pedagogical elements, to the activities in the course, engaging with students, elevating that presence, increasing belonging, and then pair that up with your learning designers and instructional designers to really make sure that students have a good learning pathway through the course, that all the web-based elements look good, that we're attending to digital accessibility and all those other issues. I think it is it it is a lot to place, you know, just on the shoulders of a single faculty member. Yeah, yeah, um, that's one of the things I love, by the way, both of you about about this report is that it effortlessly spans the levels from individual class uh, pedagogy design through the institutional strategy and uh, programmatic behavior as well as finance. That's a, or market thinking. That's a, that's a that's a lot, and it it works really really smoothly. We have more questions, and I I, I want to make sure that we get to as many of these as we can. Um, this is one from uh, Charles Finley that looks uh, uh, a little bit ahead, and he wants to know how will the use of future technology, for example, the metaverse, Web three, avatar, etc., create a new campus space for online learning. Well, we've been waiting for this for some time. So I, I've been in the space long enough. I, I've been back in, I've been in online since the 90s. And ever since then, there's always been this impending sense that we're going to move from a, you know, a text-based model to something more immersive, essentially. And it's never happened at, at any scale or sustained. And I think that's because the technology plus the business model issues just haven't hasn't been mature enough. Now, clearly, over time, that has those circumstances have changed. And I suppose my feeling is that, yes, if we can cost effectively and very flexibly from a pedagogical point of view, create truly immersive experiences, you know, hands on ex experimental then online really breaks through in a way that it, it will no longer be defined by convenience. It'll be defined by pedagogical experience. But I think we're still struggling with either business model issues or technology functionality issues or mistaking you know, what we can do versus what we should do. And simply creating a you know a virtual setting you know in in metaverse or you know what was second life years ago uh -huh, uh -huh. essentially the same idea uh -huh. essentially you know recreating a camp or often a very traditional looking physical campus in a virtual world and I, I never quite understood the value out of that from a from a pedagogical perspective it, it just seemed to be mixing up a lot of you know legacy and innovative ideas and ending up you know in, in a rather unhappy place in the middle mm. so so i still think it's it's the right direction to go in but i don't think and i'm sure it's happening at a sort of course level i'm sure there are particular applications in particular circumstances where there is a breakthrough something that is impractical to do in person 
now can be done effort, effort, effortlessly, you know, multiple times virtually. And, and the technology is, you know, mature enough that it isn't going to be obsolescent in, in, a, in a year or two. But I don't yet see it scaling up at the program level where a school will say, you know, look at our investment in X. It allows us to do Y. This is exceptional, both in terms of what's normal in the market, but also in terms of what can be done experientially, pedagogically. So I'm still waiting for that breakthrough. Uh, so directionally, you know, I think we're getting closer and closer, but I don't, I don't, I still don't think we're particularly close. And just to add to that really quickly, I, I'm not an expert in those advanced technologies. What I am an expert in is <laughs> being asked at various institutions at various points in time uh, to try to integrate advanced technologies uh, into the curriculum or school. So um, my experience has been that it's it's not as much about the technology as it is about the logistics, the cost of the technology, who who is that cost transferred to, and equally as important the training. And, you know, and uh, you know, Richard, you mentioned Second Life. Um, we were all a buzz about that. You know, twenty some years ago. There's always going to be something new that's going to come down. Um, you know, virtual courses and and all that thing, but. I don't see the training accompanying that, right? So, you know, where where the 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 pragmatics and logistics hit our excitement about this new technology is faculty needs supported in learning how to use that and using it effectively in their course. And it's not about just adding the latest, greatest web whatever, you know, is is out there right now. In some cases, you know, I, I think that it is equally as if not more vital to return to good teaching and learning regardless of the modality, to return to supporting students holistically, making sure that your online students have the same types of supports as your campus-based students. Well, thank you. Thank you. Th those are great, great, passionate answers to a, a really, really solid question. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more question. This is, uh, again, from our friend Sarah San Gregorio, um, who is excellent, and people should start hiring her, I think, immediately. Um, and she asked the question, have you seen anything regarding other support structures like OPMs or academic success coach models having an impact? Hmm. Well, I can speak to OPMs. Maybe, maybe Bethany, you can speak to the, to the mm -hmm. other pieces of it. So OPMs certainly in theory, insofar as they're supposed to, insofar as they can access Title IV funds, are supposed to be about breadth of support not just marketing and recruitment. So many of them do offer everything from finding faculty, faculty development, some supporting technologies, some course templates, design elements, as well as arranging some offline uh, experiential learning. So there's, there's definitely a range there. And I think they there that combination of a, a corporation, typically a more top down systematic approach combined with a more bottom-up academic culture in terms of the partnership has at times worked rather well. You've, you, ideally, you've got the best of both worlds somehow, and it's enabled institutions to move forward at a pace and, and in, a, in a more systematic way than the otherwise would have been able to do. Equally, you know, the average OPM is a mixture of some true say, instructional design expertise, faculty background, but also a lot of more generic corporate expertise and a lot of learning as you go. Cool. So yeah. you end up again with a, you know, I think OPMs are very, are often good practice. You know, are they, are they necessarily cutting edge? Uh, perhaps not, because they'll run into problems around efficiency and, and, and business model. So I do, I do think online has been aided by an unusual pairing at scale of a, a corporate approach to higher ed, if I can put it that way, and, and a traditional higher ed approach to, to the same thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can see from the, the fallout of OPMs is that how long does that arc last for? Uh, what, you know, is the value of an OPM primarily marketing and recruitment and everything else is kind of window dressing to some extent or not as, not as invested in? And I think the closer the OPM contribution co comes to the academic pedagogical core, the more sensitivity the institution feels around it, and the more they feel like, well, that's core business. So I think what will be interesting is OPMs seem to move a little off center stage and institutions seem to be taking on more of this. 
is whether they can take the best of their OPM approach and double down on it and improve on it, or whether they find that that corporate rigor is somehow uh, a, a key missing feature and that they struggle to replicate it. And OPMs can be a great aid for institutions that, that really aren't staffed in those unique ways to support online enrollment, online program management, et cetera. Um, you know, it comes with the caveat, not all P OPMs are equal, and we're actually going to be asking some questions about OPMs um, and, and institutional relationships specifically with OPMs in, in CLOE 9. Um, to the second part of that question, in, in terms of different types of student support and mentors and, and specific student advisors, you do see institutions that are taking advantage of that, and I think doing really well with it, Western Governors as an example, mm -hmm. um, but really having, you know, again, looking at the ways that online students need to be uniquely supported. And it may not be in the traditional way that institutions are used to supporting students. So I, I think that um, we're going to need to look at, at the, the student focused area of this, especially when online is increasing institutions are increasing online offerings, not just in their discrete courses, but most especially in their online degree programs. That was a huge finding of CLOE 8. The number one way that chief online officers told us that they are meeting increased demand for online enrollment was to create new online programs. That then creates a climate of increased competition. Mm -hmm. Right. So students want to know, how am I going to be better supported at your institution? Why is your online NBA better than the one that's over here? And it's not just a conversation around price. It's also a, a, a conversation around quality and not just quality of design, but quality of student supports, the quality and effectiveness of the of the faculty that are teaching that and, and whether or not it, you know, it is an overall good experience um, where, where students are uniquely supported in that. Well, uh, thank you. This, this is great. By the way, um, uh, that OPM stands for Online Project Management, uh, and that uh, program, program, program management. excuse me. And uh, in in the chat, um, Steve Ehrman said that's the nickname for a company that does that. And then uh, Ed Webb gave me the thing I cannot now unsee, which is the OPM of the masses, um, which is uh, just that's that's brilliant. Um, we have time for one last question. This is from uh, our our dear friend in Armenia who couldn't make it tonight. Um, but he wanted to ask you, how is AI changing how online education addresses assignments and assessments? <laughs> well, my short answer is I think it, it's, it's still very early days, but I think the potential benefit is certainly efficiency and, and volume of production of these things insofar as there are any bottlenecks around conventional ways of producing them. and. If you can ask the right prompts and and the and the tool is trained on the right data, then does it surface, you know, incremental improvements to those documents and those assessments that otherwise wouldn't be surfaced or would take forever to be surfaced? So I think all of that could be helpful, but we know we don't suffer from a lack of assessments or, or lack of documentation. It's mm -hmm. it's you know we, we got we got to focus on the quality, the what are we trying to achieve as well as some some efficiency potential gains. Yeah, I mean, the, the AI question is on everybody's minds right now. And, and, you know, every time I go to a conference, it's the AI sessions that are most heavily attended. So I, I think this this is a question everybody is is wrestling with. I think the institutions that are approaching it in terms of how can we better help our students use AI and learn to be responsible with AI because it's going to be you know, part of, of everyone's life, kind of the similar to the conversations of becoming a good digital citizen um, mm. that, that prevailed mm. a couple of years ago. I think that that's the route that institutions are going to have to take rather than having policies against it. Uh, in Chloe 9, we are going to have a section on AI. Um, you know, as a team, we, you know, we kind of discussed where do we want to focus this questioning and where are institutions with it? And so we're asking questions about whether or not you have policies around it whether or not your faculty and staff are using it really for, for efficiencies in designing courses and supporting students in unique ways and how are students using it. So when I'm looking at the polls and, and looking at the articles on this, student use is far outpacing faculty use or institutional uh -huh. use of AI. So uh -huh. hopefully 
institutions get out ahead of this a little bit. Um, you know, in, in academia, we're not great on accepting change. We're not very agile. But I, I think AI forces the conversation on, on both of those points. Um, I, I hate to say this, but, but thank you for that last answer, because we are at the end of our hour. Um, both of you, Richard and, and Bethany, you just delivered really precise and concise uh, responses to uh, Brent's uh, very powerful question. Uh, I, I need to thank you both so much for being fantastic guests this hour. Uh, your report is essential reading, and and I think your conversation is essential viewing. Uh, let, let me ask, how, how can we keep up with you uh, both? Uh, what's the best way to follow you and what you're up to next? Well, uh, me on LinkedIn. Yeah, same for me, LinkedIn, yeah. Very good. We can yeah. certainly do that. We can certainly do that. Well, we'll see you there. And uh, Bethany, we're looking forward to a fine uh, Valentine's Day, I think, for you. And yep. uh, Richard, we're looking forward to you solving some huge data problems. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm on it. Everyone else, remember on the bottom left of the screen, you can see a link to Chloe 8, uh, as well as a link to signing up for, uh, it will be Chloe 9, right? Yes, Chloe yes. Nine. So there, there's a link there for senior online officers to sign up to receive the Chloe 9 survey, because you get a unique survey link for your institution. So please do that because we couldn't do the Chloe report uh, without you. And Brian, thank you so much for having us as, as guests today. We really appreciate it. Oh. Yes. Thanks, well, Brian. Thanks, everyone. My pleasure. Well, don't go away yet, friends. Uh, we need to just wrap things up. But uh, I want to thank you all for the great questions uh, that came in. If you want to keep talking about these questions, everything from AI and assessment uh, to all the other findings of Chloe, please keep the conversation going on on all the socials, as they say. Uh, you can find me there on Twitter, on Mastodon, on Threads, and Blue Sky, of course, on my blog. Just use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we've talked about similar reports and online learning in general, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And if you'd like to look ahead, we have a whole bunch of sessions coming up on everything from anti-racism and improving college teaching to supporting mental health and a holiday community gathering. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Let me thank you all again for thinking together and participating together. I hope those of you in the Northern Hemisphere are staying as warm as possible, and I hope everybody's doing well as we're coming to the end of the academic season for 2023. Take care, everyone. Be well, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>